SpaceX Starhopper and Starship updates, 200 meter test imminent and Amos 17 flight summary. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. My last three episodes were from the new What About It in-depth spin-off as you might have noticed by the title. I chose to make a difference here as I actually got comments from people asking me if I was still doing SpaceX news and that they didn't recognize it as a normal What About It episode. So do not fear, you still get your SpaceX updates here, but if there's nothing happening and I feel like it, I'll do these in-depth episodes about a single topic. So now I created this pre-title to make it clear even before you click on the episode if it's an in-depth episode about a single topic or if it's just a normal space news. Now that we got that out of the way, today's episode is not an in-depth episode about a single topic, today it's all about the SpaceX progress and there has been a lot, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates SpaceX is really accelerating their progress beyond anything right now. A good title for this episode would have also been How to build two spaceships insanely fast. Since I reported last on it, we got two new ring segments stacked. The interesting thing about this is that it's already passed some of the estimates on how tall the orbital prototypes would get. This is turning into some sort of Tower of Babel thing and don't forget about it, these two orbital prototypes are supposed to go into orbit with three engines. Elon made it clear once more that the two teams in Boca Chica, Texas and Coco, Florida are racing against each other. They're allowed to help each other and share knowledge but ultimately it's a race. And no matter how many disbelievers are out there, these two orbital prototypes are supposed to go into orbit. We're not talking 500 meters or 5 kilometers, we're talking at least LEO with 100 kilometers. And again, according to Elon, until the end of the year, that's lightning fast progress shown by the teams in Boca Chica and Coco. Next up we have more and detailed pictures of the welding marks. I'm showing these in full screen here as I had requests for it, so here you go. They look very precise and are definitely following a distinct pattern. We have different theories already from shrinking the metal to stiffening it. They also could well be related to the methane transpirational cooling system. Elon stated that this cooling system which makes Starship sweat cryogenic methane cools the hull and gets rid of the heat much like an ablative shield where the heat is transported away together with the ablated material from the shield. It's all still speculation if these marks on the hull have anything to do with that cooling system but we'll get more information hopefully at the Starship presentation in Boca Chica on August 24th. Next up we have news on the 200 meter hop test we're all still waiting for. First August 12th was the date to watch out for but Elon tweeted that he's still waiting for an FAA approval. Now he tweeted this on last week's Friday and he said no earlier than a week so that would put the test on this week's Friday. Then on Saturday he tweeted that he just spoke with the FAA and that he's still hoping for a test on Friday. Now finally we also have dates on the Cameron County website. This might still change but right now it looks like Friday the 16th is the day to stay up late with backup dates on Saturday and Sunday. The hop will be from where it did the 20 meter hop up 200 meters and then to the landing pad. But what about it? What will happen to the Starhopper after the 200 meter test flight? According to sources from nasaspaceflight.com, Hopper won't leave the landing pad alive. It will be cannibalized for parts. So in a week or so, Starhopper will already have a grand finale and then we'll have to say goodbye. Starship will then be put together most likely at the landing pad after Starhopper has been retired. A new and much larger crane is already in place. It's been delivered and assembled last week and it is capable of lifting both prototype pieces up and assembling them. So besides stacking ring segments, it will most likely be used to lift up both prototype pieces for assembly at the pad. And then the sky is the limit. As soon as one of these two prototypes is able to fly, we're going to see the next wave of tests. First up to 500 meters and then all the way into orbit, including a re-entry, exciting times. Access hatches, very similar to those we've seen on the Starhopper, are being installed on the orbital prototypes in Boca Chica and Coco. I guess SpaceX has learned a lesson or two from the barbecue hopper. So we can probably expect these hatches to be properly sealed before the ignition. And more rainbirds are being installed at the launch site. SpaceX wants to prevent fires and reduce the sound levels further. Lesson learned again, good job. We do not want to see any more wildfires in the area, bad press and even more important, very bad for the environment. There's still work to be done on the wind barrier but the structure is almost done. The plating should be applied pretty soon. 
But I keep asking myself one question. I do not see the orbital prototype to fit in there when it's stacked. Are we missing something here? Starhopper wet testing done. On August 9th was the wet testing in preparation for the 200 meter hop. Fueling and venting were done without any problems. There is no information on another static fire before the test though, so we might go straight for the hop now. So this is it for Starhopper and Starship progress. More on that on Thursday prior to the 200 meter hop test. Amos 17 launch summary. Since my last three episodes were in-depth episodes, as stated at the beginning of the video, I have not done a launch summary on the recent Falcon 9 Amos 17 launch. Though as I love launches, and you might too, consider this one as old but very interesting. So here we go, here's the summary of the Amos 17 launch. On Tuesday, August 6 was one of those precious days for rocket enthusiasts again, when a Falcon 9 goes up into space. As before, on the CRS-18 mission, the 45th Space Wing reported rather bad weather for this launch. The report said only 40% favorable due to thunderstorms in the area and in fact a few lightning strikes were recorded prior to the launch. Though again, the weather had mercy and so at 7.23 pm Eastern Time the rocket took off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. This was SpaceX's 10th launch in 2019, which puts them a bit behind last year's achievement. SpaceX's customer was Israel-based Spacecom. And Spacecom has some history with SpaceX. Amos 6 was scheduled to launch on Saturday, September 3rd in 2016 and was already secured atop a Falcon 9 rocket when it exploded during a routine pre-launch static fire test. Now the Amos 6 satellite was supposed to bring internet to Sub-Sahara Africa and was co-leased by Facebook. Reports say Mark Zuckerberg cried when the rocket exploded. On January 2, 2017, SpaceX released an official statement indicating that the cause of the failure was a buckled liner in several of the COPV tanks, causing perforations that allowed liquid oxygen to accumulate underneath the lining, which was ignited by friction. This was not to happen today though. Amos 17 is not a replacement for Amos 6. Amos stands for African Mediterranean Orbital Satellite. And the 17 stands for 17 degrees east longitude location. It will provide communication to the Middle East, Africa and Europe from a geostationary orbit. The booster had its third and final flight on this mission as it was expendable, to give the satellite a bit extra speed for orbit insertion. The first stage burned for another 30 seconds, leaving no fuel for a landing. This has the benefit that the satellite is left with much more internal propellant, giving it a greatly extended operational life of over 20 years. So no booster landing this time. Falcon 9 rolled out to the pad at T-16 hours and went vertical at T-12 hours. At T-35 minutes the propellant got loaded and was topped off at T-6 minutes just before the launch. This is done on every flight for a few reasons. Propellant cost makes up a very little part of the total launch costs, so it does not need to be saved. Though if you top off the tanks on every flight, you always have the same liftoff mass, which makes calculations and procedures much easier. Also, the acceleration can be kept more constant if the tanks always have the same load. And the rocket took off just fine this time. At T plus one minute, it punched through the cloud layer just around max Q, which is the point of maximum dynamic pressure from the atmosphere for those who do not know. We got a really nice view of the rocket above the clouds from the onboard camera as the Falcon continued its ascent. Then came a nice and clean separation of the first stage and a farewell to a trusty booster as it plummeted back through the atmosphere to crash into the ocean. Fun fact, if you're wondering what a Falcon 9 looks like after three years at sea, here's a nice picture. This booster is either from a failed launch in 2015 or the CIS-4 mission. It's stranded on a beach in Great Britain and loads of barnacles chose it as a new home at sea. Then came a perfectly executed fairing separation and that wouldn't be the last we'd see of those two fairing halves. But more on that later. The second stage had a clean first burn until T plus 8 minutes and 17 seconds, enabling the upper stage to get into a good coasting orbit for another 18 minutes. The second burn ignited just fine for another minute. Another four and a half minutes later, the upper stage deployed Amos 17 into the desired orbit. 
Now as we had no booster landing this time, which always leaves me with kind of a bad aftertaste as that's normally the highlight of a SpaceX launch, here's another kind of recovery for this launch. Remember how I told you that we'd see these fairings again? Gomez 3 managed to do it again for the second time in a row. The ship was at exactly the right spot at exactly the right time to catch one half of the fairing without it touching the water. Very well done. Meanwhile, Go Navigator was busy recovering the other half from the sea. And one more news, Captain Elliot, Gomez 3's sister ship, has been renamed to Gomez Chief and is already at Cape Canaveral to join the SpaceX fleet. According to Elon himself, Gomez Chief will be fitted with a net similar to Gomez 3's and try to catch the second fairing half. Well done SpaceX! So this concludes the launch summary of Amos 17 and wraps up today's episode of What About It. Did you watch the Amos 17 launch live and how many of you do that on a regular basis anyway? And will Starhopper make us proud before the team that built it comes to take it apart again? As always, tell me in the comments. The end of the episode is again reserved for my patrons. The Discord is getting crowded and I couldn't be more happy to get in contact with so many of you. I'm enjoying the chats and I love to get feedback on ideas and episodes, so thank you very much for supporting the cause and helping me to make better content. You guys rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most. To bring you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Let the two teams in Boca Chica, Florida... Boca Chica, Florida... Exciting times. Exciting times. Reports say Mark Zuckerberg cried when the rocket exploded. <laughs> you can't do this without laughing. <laughs> no, not updates. Ooh. Ah.